Well, hi everybody. It is a real treat to be back with so many uh, old friends here. Um, um, I, I was, um, I, as I explained, I um, came to IDS in 1994, um, just as elders, elders were kind of being born. And um, Alan asked me to give, give a bit of a kind of retrospective of what's changed in the last 20 years and where is, where is this heading. So um, I'll be taking, one of the things that really struck me in um, both Melissa and Alan's presentation is actually how many parallel universes there are out there. Um, so I'll be taking you the trip down memory lane in the universe that I was in, um, which some of you may recognise. Um, and um, so it is quite a kind of a, an IDS centric and a, and a UK centric view of things. But I hope you'll um, you'll recognise some of these things, and some of these things will will um, will sort of um, cement some of the points already made. Um, but hopefully there's a new there's a few new ideas here. Um, there's certainly a few new images. Um, I started doing this as I usually do. Um, preparing a new presentation by going back to my archive of presentations over the last 20 years. I have got about a thousand, um, and, but there actually wasn't very much there, but I, I thought I'd, there was one picture which I, um, which I thought I'd share with you. This, this is the, um, something I did for, um, I think it was actually Catherine, Catherine's farewell party. It is a, a picture of the, the ascent of intermediary man. Um, and it's talking, it, it, this was filmed in South Africa um, at, at, one, at a sort of an early man exhibition that we went to. And you'll see we're reenacting this. And so here's where I came into a sort of early slime mold um, of the information disseminator. And we, were, um, we went through various intermediate stages. Uh, we, see, we see Asia is actually there as, a, as, a, as a quite an advanced knowledge intermediary. And then Alan was at the final form, an eldest editor, perhaps we've gone too far. Um, where's the bar? <laughs> um, now I thought this probably isn't enough for this audience, so I should be a bit more analytic. And uh, so I tried to kind of go back over the last 20 years to, to try and make sense in my head at some of the main, um, the main sort of turning points along the way. Um, what's changed a lot? Um, all these things have changed enormously in the last 20 years. Um, and um, to try and make sense of this, um, I've broken it down into um, a series of different stages, um, as you'll see. So I'm going to go through these um, and give you some of the highlights along the way. Let me start in the beginning, the pre eldest phase. Here's a picture from the IDS library, just out there. Uh, I'm not sure of the date, um, but this was probably when the library was at its, at, at its, at its heyday. Um, before computers had, been, had come in, the catalogue was king, um, and every serious research organisation would obviously need to have a big library. It was never challenged. Um, now, I arrived at the, um, at the, a bit later than this. The, the um, computers had arrived here. CDS ISIS was the, um, was the platform being used. And the, the fact that there was a technical team here, um, Debbie um, and Peter Ferguson and, uh, um, and, uh, and others, that laid the platform, that brought the launch pad on which Elders was built. So let's talk about the early days. Um, I don't know if you remember that series, the It Crowd. This is, this is where they're describing to Jen, the boss. That's kind of me, the boss. Yes, this box here is the internet. <laughs> um, very funny sketch. Um, research communication was in its infancy uh, at this stage. Um, in those days, the policy briefing this four-page document with hardly any references was really revolutionary. Um, it took me a long time in IDS to, to, to kind of to get the concept that you don't need to have five pages of references um, for everything. Um, nobody knew if the internet was going to catch on. It was kind of a bit of a fantasy thing, really, and we were playing with it. So it was an era of real experimentation. And um, Elvis was launched. ID21 the next um, very soon afterwards. Euphoric was actually um, taking off. Remember, Bellness in Canada was a real early pioneer. Um, I think there's a, um, a special uh, mention of a few funders here. Denida um, and um, IDRC, I think, were some of the early pioneers. Um, but the library role was under scrutiny already. It's been under scrutiny kind of regularly ever since. Um, but it was, um, the internet was seen as a real kind of um, threat for many librarians. 
So let's move on. This is the sort of catching the wave, wave phase. And in those days, you could see keyboards were big enough, you could actually surf on them. <laughs> and we were all, we were all that, we were a lot younger in those days as well. Um, now, the web was clearly taking off. And I, I knew this, I, this has confirmed for me um, when I was driving to work. And I was overtaking a lorry that was a milk lorry. And the milk lorry had a URL on the side of the milk lorry. And I thought, oh my god. It has really happened. Now everything, now your, now your fridge has probably got a URL on it, but uh, it has really taken off. Um, research communication was also taking off, and the, the rapid program at ODI was set up in this period. Um, knowledge management escaped from the US military, and it hit the development sector. Um, remember, some of you were old enough to remember Jim Wolfenson at the bank, who, who kind of rebranded the bank as the Knowledge Bank. And a whole lot of things got going in that era, um, GDNet, which, uh, it's a shame that Shireen can't be here. The development gateway was actually a big, um, a bit, caused a big kerfuffle for a lot of us. Um, but initiatives like SciDev got going. There was a whole range of different knowledge management initiatives, different resource centers, which, um, uh, which we got involved in. It was a really exciting period. And I think this is when D-groups got going. You can tell me more later, I think, uh, in this period. So there was a lot of pioneering work. Um, at this time, the DFID budget was expanding, um, the research budget was expanding, the real need to have an impact with your research was seen, and other donors were getting on board. So this was a real takeoff period for this, and the internet, the whole kind of online thing was, was a happening place to be working. It was a really exciting period. Um, we rode this wave for this next period, and this, this, um, this document which actually Liz uh, worked with me on was from a... Um, um, a conference held here in 2007 on maximizing the impact of development research. At this stage, I thought we cracked it because this agenda was riding high um, and people really got it about the need to do this communication job much better. Um, now, research communication become way more sophisticated. The models, which no longer simple linear models, they were starting to think about the different dimensions of this. And the knowledge intermediary was, was emerging as a concept of people sitting in this kind of intermediate role, the knowledge broker. Um, it was being recognized, it was being studied, and it was seen as being actually a really interesting piece of the puzzle. Um, that's when the um, IK Meadery program got going. Um, now, at the same time, technology-wise, the mobile phone was taking off here. Web 2 was opening up new avenues, and so online communities were starting to be formed. This is when uh, I'm not quite sure when the Elvis community's got going, but it was kind of, things were taking off here. Wikis, crowdsourcing. Um, now there was a lot of hype, um, and nobody really knew what the hell was happening. Um, I remember Chris Addison uh, talking to us on many occasions, and we were, about the new wave of technology, and we were, we were kind of thinking, yeah, is it going to really happen? <laughs> Most of it did, didn't it? Um, at this stage, funding was still relatively easy to find in the UK, so, um, um, it was the, the, the wave was continuing. Now I call this, this period kind of high tide. Um, things were happening out there, for sure. So social media really kicked in during this period. The op open knowledge was gaining a foothold. And um, apart from the GOC, GOC program, this is, MOOCs have been taking off in a big way. Um, now one thing that's changed a bit is that um, with, within, certainly within, in the UK, a lot of knowledge work is being done at the program level rather than the individual project level. So there's a whole, there's a number of new knowledge hubs for great big programs where you're bringing together maybe six or seven different consortia and trying to um, um, do knowledge um, sharing for that wider group. There's also an interesting new shift to looking at the demand side of, of knowledge. All this push, push, push is, is good enough, but what about the other side? How do you, how do you develop build the demand for, um, um, for evidence. Now, despite all the effort of, of a lot of people, the um, proving impact has still remained extremely elusive. The frameworks for thinking about this are now much more sophisticated, but it hasn't gone away as a challenge. But it became increasingly hard during this period to fund collection and curation work, that kind of um, long-term knowledge intermediary role, which had been growing in the last, um, in the last few years. Um, and I think knowledge management um, 
had, had gone out of vogue with most, most agencies. They tried it and they couldn't get it to work very much. And it sounded just rather expensive. And so they never, they never bought the lie that, they, that, they, that came from industry that this is absolutely fundamental to our organisation. So if you go into a big knowledge, most big development agencies these days, they are as chaotic as ever. So where, where are we today? Um, ICT is more powerful than ever. Big data is upon us. These ubiquitous mobile devices, which we couldn't imagine a few years ago. And this kind of culture of, you know, we want it now. We want it free. Um, I think research communication is actually alive and well. Um, it's being reinvented. It's embedded in programs much more. Um, but what is much harder to find is funding for freestanding, long-term knowledge initiatives. Um, and this is something that, that, um, that makes me uh, grieve. Um, because it's something that we really put our, put our weight behind here, and many of you have put your weight behind. And some big initiatives um, have stopped or are winding down. And I think there's a bit of a crisis in, the, in that sector of the market, even though there are exciting things happening elsewhere. Um, interesting, there's a renewed focus on learning. That's, that's an old term, it's come back. Knowledge management is sort of yesterday's. It's now about learning. Now it's kind of, it's the same thing, but just said a different way. So there's, when one thing, when one set of terms kind of dies, another one comes up. Um, always the way. Now, I'm going to quick, I, I spent the last six or seven years kind of in a, on a detour out of development studies into the climate work world. And I want to just give you a quick story of that because I think a lot of the lessons are very similar. Um, so this was clearly a massive priority. Um, there's a need for information at so many levels here. And um, there's this, there was this syndrome, portal proliferation syndrome, which was really, um, it's really strong in the climate world, as in any new area, you get this massive explosion of things. With, uh, and, but you've got this huge tendency for sort of silos to form. Um, so, what should we do about this? And, and if in doubt, hold a workshop, I think is still the maxim. Um, and we held a really interesting workshop with quite a few members from IES in, uh, in Germany with various other kind of knowledge players in the climate sector to test out the appetite for working together. And like with the ERD group, it turned out that information people really instinctively want to work together. So we've had a very interesting ride with the Climate Knowledge Brokers group. Um, so do Google them if you're, um, um, if you're interested. Um, great signs of progress, um, community of practice, really good collaborative ethos, and some very clever data sharing tools which take advantage of this kind of semantic search type thing. There's a thing called the Knowledge Navigator, which was developed here, which is kind of like a portal of portals. And then the Climate Tagger is a, um, a very clever automated tagging device. So if you're into that kind of thing, check it out. I think it's really um, a really interesting example. An emerging vision of what this knowledge broker thing was all about. We published a manifesto, which is um, which I think would chime in with a lot of the work that many of you are doing. Um, and recently, there's a big focus on capacity building, because whatever we're doing at a global level, oh, um, I see there's some manifestos at the back there that Alan is holding up. Um, um, so we're looking to have gear up capacity building in this area, because this needs to be happening at so many different levels. You know, clearly, it's not about global players broadcasting to the world. It needs to be happening at country level, and um, at many different levels. But the Achilles heel here, for all this work in the climate sector and in most of the work we're all doing, is funding. <laughs> Getting things off the ground, exciting new ideas off the ground, is actually relatively easy. It's keeping them going, which is the killer. Um, and um, I, um, I'd be interested to know what, how the Ebola, these, these kind of rapid response initiatives, whether there, whether there is a long-term strategy, and I think this is something maybe to come back to tomorrow, is how do you build these? Um, so for me, this is, the, this is the big weakness of so much of this innovation, is, that, is the business plan for keeping it going. Some things have not changed at all since 1996. It all hinges on people. This is one of our, one of our staff retreats. I don't know what the advantage it is, um, but this stuff does not happen at the click of a switch. Um, it's, it requires skills, dedication, ingenuity, 
support systems, a conducive setting um, to do it, um, and um, clearly it requires funding. So I want to just re-stress that it's about people. Um, this is a slide on where it's all going, but I think I'll, we've covered a lot of this. I will um, clearly a whole lot of stuff is happening here. Um, one of the things which I'll do, I will stress though is, is atomization. I think an amazing amount of things are happening, but they're happening in such a dispersed way that, that, that how the hell do you make sense of all that, all that kind of atomized knowledge work? Um, I think that's where the, there is clearly a role for intermediaries to help bring that together. And where does that leave the user? Well, there are many different types of users, but you probably recognize yourself down here. Um, the the, the hyper-connected person who is completely overwhelmed by the amount of stuff coming across their, their, uh, their device each day. At the other end of the spectrum, the African farmer is where they were. Are they getting, are they getting re readily accessible, relevant information to help them on their decisions? I don't think so. So there are massive massive um, challenges out there at both ends of the spectrum. So, as a community, where do we go from here? Um, is it time to pack up our portals and head for the bar? Has the era of portals kind of come and gone, and actually it's all different now, um, and we should sort of um, accept that, you know, we did it, it was appropriate for the time, let's move on to something else. Or is it the time to regroup, reinvent, and particularly radically improve our funding pitch. Because I think we've been very, very slow to really realize that we need to present our work in a much more attractive and relevant way. Let's discuss that. Thank you very much.